All right, where are we? Last time we left her off right in the middle, and we're just going to pick up where we left off. We, we, where, 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 did we, where did we leave off? We were talking about stress this week. We're taking relationships and putting them in context. We're pulling back the focus. We're saying, wait, wait a minute, a relationship is more than just two people talking. They're, they're talking somewhere. They're talking in the night. They're talking in the day. They're talking in their house. They're talking uh, in an alley. Context matters. And one particular part of the context that has been studied a lot is stress. The presence of elements in the environment of a relationship that either de make demand, that draw energy out of the relationship, or that provide resources that give energy towards the relationship. And stress, as we said, usually makes intimate relationships harder. On average, stress is associated with negative outcomes. And, and, and then we said, well, maybe not always, but in particular, people who are chronically stressed, people for, for whom they just, who, people who are, have a stably low level of resources to devote to the relationship, that's going to be a problem. And a lot of research shows that that's true. People who have ongoing difficulties outside the relationship are likely to have difficulties within the relationship. Which raised a question, and was the question we ended on. What about underprivileged populations? And when I say underprivileged, that's sort of a nice way of saying poor. What about people who are just poor? They get married, people who are poor get married at the same rate, approximately, as everybody else, which is to say, you know, everyone in the population gets married regardless of whether you're poor, middle class, or, or rich. The question is, if everything we say about stress is true, then the relationship should somehow be different. Intimacy, the process of maintaining intimacy, should be different and more difficult for people who are poor. Is this true? It's really true. It's extremely true. Let's talk about how true it is. This is research um, that looks at a nationally representative sample that was collected in 1995, but there's no reason to think anything's changed since 1995. The data were published in 2002. And what it did was, this is very straightforward, it looked at divorce rates across the country according to different characteristics of neighborhoods that people live in. So for example, if you look at the amount of unemployment in a neighborhood where people live, in neighborhoods where unemployment rates are low, the yellow always means low, divorce rates are relatively low. But where the unemployment rate is high, you'd expect that's going to be, where a neighborhood where more people are unemployed is going to be a poor neighborhood, divorce rates are a lot higher. How about this one? Where the personal income is low, that's kind of the definition of being poor, divorce rates are Right up here, what is this? This is percent is right here. 44% of first marriages are predicted to end in divorce? That's pretty high. Where incomes are high, the highest third of incomes in the United States, divorce rates are 23%, almost half, basically half. Think about that. The divorce rate, divorce is a problem in the United States and across the world. But it's not a problem equally for everybody. Divorce rates are twice as high in low-income neighborhoods as in high-income neighborhoods. Twice as high. That's an enormous effect. How much money you make affects the success of your marriage. That's a good reason to uh, study hard in college. Let's look at the opposite. Poverty. The amount of poverty in a neighborhood is associated in exactly the same way with divorce. When poverty rates are low, divorce rates are low. Neighborhoods where poverty rates are high, divorce rates are twice as high. And, people, and how about the amount of people in a neighborhood on welfare? Where not a lot of people are on welfare, in those neighborhoods, divorce rates are low. Where lots of people are on welfare, divorce rates are high. So poverty is, now this is not a causal, necessarily, this is not causal data, but it's really suggestive that these are huge effects. That in parts of the country where people are poor, marriages break up twice as twice as frequently. Here's another way of thinking about this. It's not just that marriages are breaking up, but they're breaking up quicker. 
This is an interesting graph. Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> I borrowed this. I don't even know how to do that. If you, let's ask this. At how long do marriages last before 30% of them have broken up? How far do you have to wait in, in the length of a marriage before you have a 30% chance of getting divorced? In a high-income neighborhood, it takes you 14 years to get to a point where 30% of the marriages have gotten divorced. 14 years to get 30% risk. In a middle-income neighborhood, it takes you nine years to get to the same level of risk. So the middle income, you're getting 30% of the marriages are getting divorced quicker. In low income, six years to get to the same point. So it's not just that there's a higher risk, but it's quicker. These marriages are ending quicker. Again, this is, uh, that's based on the same data, by the way. So this is, this is, I mean, this is something we don't talk about a lot. We think, well, you know, divorce, hey, everyone, nobody wants to get divorced. And it's true, nobody does want to get divorced. And you think, you know what, when I show these data to people, people say, well, what about Hollywood celebrities? They're always getting divorced, those guys. So rich people, rich people don't have it easy. Rich people's marriages aren't that stable. You see the flaws in that argument. Hollywood celebrities represent, oh, one thousandth of one millionth of a percent of the United States. Most rich people in the United States are not Hollywood celebrities. Most rich people you've never heard of. They're just quietly rich, and their marriages last a long time. <laughs> Don't let anyone tell you, oh, you know, it's tough to be rich, too. Most of the time, it isn't. Like, if you have a choice, be rich. <laughs> so we're looking at divorce here, but maybe that's just the divorce part. What about the quality of the relationships? Maybe poor people and rich people have the same quality relationships, but poor people are just quicker to end it. They're, you know, they're less committed to the institution, so they just end quicker. No, that's not true. And this is data that I personally collected in a study I'll tell you about in a few minutes. But basically, we compared, again, for high, middle, and low income individuals who were in intimate relationships. We just compared how well, how, how happy are you? How satisfied are you with your relationship? These are the married people. Here's the rich people, pretty happy. Middle class people, pretty happy. But the poor people were significantly less happy. These are the poor married people, significantly less happy than the middle or wealthy married people. What about the people who are in intimate relationships but not married? Well, we compared them too. And now, all of these people were less happy than the married people. Good news. Married people are always happier, at least in this sample. But still, even if you're, if you're unmarried, the poor unmarried people still were the least happy. In fact, they were the least uh, happy people in the, entire, in the entire sample. The least happy with their relationships. So being poor is powerfully associated not only with the stability, with whether your relationship lasts or not, but also with the quality of your relationship while you're in it in ways that we don't talk about a whole lot. Well, why? What is it about being poor, about being chronically underprivileged, about not having a lot of resources that would make it hard to be intimate? You know, you'd like to believe, well, love, love doesn't need jewelry, love doesn't need money. We can just live on bread, water, and passion. But the reality is somewhat different. In fact, there are many ways that an environment of poverty or, or underprivilege or disadvantage constrains low-income couples. Constrains meaning makes it hard to maintain intimacy. We've been talking this whole course about how to maintain intimacy. We've been talking this whole course about all the different things to do, all the different ways to think and behave, to maintain and strengthen a bond with another person. Well, if you are poor, there are a number of ways that that's harder. Here's one. Poor couples simply have less time. Now, this has been researched a number of ways. For example, people who are the poorer people in the United States are more likely to do shift work or to have non-standard hours. What I mean by that is 
Um, you know, I'm a professor, so I get to work, well, I get to work whenever I want. It's such a great job, it's ridiculous. But a lot of people have jobs that like they work for, you know, from 9 to 5 or from you know, 10 to 6. But uh, imagine there's some jobs in the world where you have to work late shifts or the night shift, or you have to work like from 5 in the afternoon to 2 in the morning, or you have to work the evening shift from 11 at night to 7 in the morning. That's what shift work means. And the people who are, people who are poor are much more likely to be in those jobs, the jobs that require, like jobs where there's a factory that runs all night and they're the night shift or the janitorial staff, the, the people who are, well, the, the nights that I choose, that I elect to work late. My schedule those days overlaps with the schedule of the people who don't choose their jobs, but who clean the buildings at, in, um, in Franz Hall, the psychology building, where their shift begins at 9 a.m. They only start cleaning the building when everyone else leaves, at 9 p.m., excuse me. It's, a lot of research makes this point that poor people are less likely to have what we consider regular hours. They're less likely to sort of work during the main part of the day and have evening hours at night. Also, poor people work more hours when they are employed and, of course, for less pay. The result is they have less time, less flexible time. People who are poor in the United States simply have less time that they can choose what they want to do with their time. That's my next point. It's not just that you have less time, it's that you have less flexible time. So again, take an example of, um, again, I, when, I, when I try to think of the luckiest person, I have to only hold up myself. So, um, you know, a professor, aside from having to be in this class, and again, it's a pleasure to be in this class, but uh, I have very few other obligations. You know, meeting here, meeting there, oh, my kid is sick, I cancel it. Oh, my wife's having a baby, I get a friend, good friend, talented friend, to take, cover my lectures for me. That's very lucky. I've got flexible time. Oh, I need to take the car in. Okay, in the morning I'll take the car in and then I'll go to my afternoon lecture. What's well, a great job. Sorry, I don't want to, I'm not trying to harp on it. <laughs> but poor couples don't have flexible time. Poor couples are more likely to be in jobs that don't give you vacations, that don't give you sick leave, that if you, so now you're in a job where they say, you, you have to be here at 9 a.m on the line of the assembly line, or you're fired. And if you work part-time, because you have to do several jobs just to make ends meet, several part-time jobs to make ends meet, you're not allowed to not show up or be late. You have to stick a time, a time card in. You've got a card? Have you heard of a time card? Maybe you've even used a time card. We actually have a card, and you start to stick it into some little time. Raise your hand if you've ever done that. Oh, wow. My understanding is that that's not that fun. The point being that someone's monitoring when you show up, and every time you don't show up, you don't get paid. If I show up to work late, that doesn't affect my salary. I get paid the same thing whether I show up at 2 or 2.30. If you're on a time card, you get paid for the hours you're there, which means if you've got a sick kid, a car that is in the shop, and suddenly a, 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 someone's making a demand on you, and you need a little bit of flexibility there, your partner needs extra support because your partner's sick. You don't have that flexibility. Or if you take it, it costs you. You pay for the flexibility in a way that middle class or our richer people don't have to pay. So poor couples have less time, they have less flexible time, and at the same time, they have more demands on their time. A lot of research on this point, that people who are in the poor strata of socioeconomic status have more sickness. More, are more, more stressful events, more sick relatives, more crises, essentially, that would require them to be away from work or away from their family. In other words, they have more demands that require the exact time and flexible time that they lack. Kind of a catch-22. So all of this, you would expect, would make, would constrain, would crunch even more than, than for other couples the amount of time available for maintaining intimacy. And indeed this research shows, research on intimacy in poor couples, that these exact issues, these exact constraints that I just identified for you do indeed relate to the outcomes of relationships. When couples lack shared leisure time, divorce risk goes up. Just think about that. Think back at the importance of shared leisure time. 
and how we take it for granted. We who are not poor take for granted that if we have a relationship partner, an intimate partner, either a lover or a spouse or a boyfriend or a girlfriend, that we'll be able to just sit with that person and watch a movie or go out to a meal together or hold hands or talk or just have a moment to sit on the couch and say, so, how are you doing? Or Let me tell you a story about the day. You're going to laugh at this when you hear about this thing I just had. We take for granted. And that, those moments, I dare say, and we sort of have assumed throughout the course, intimacy rests on those moments. The maintenance of intimacy is grounded in that shared leisure time, that shared time to share intimate moments, emotional expressions. When couples lack it, divorce risk goes up. And couples lack it when they are working opposite shifts, taking care of sick relatives, working hard just to make ends meet. Married women who work nights have three times greater divorce risk than married women who work the same number of hours but during the day. Why? Because if you work nights, that nights are times when couples share intimacy. Not just sexual intimacy. I'm talking about emotional intimacy, any kind of closeness, including sexual intimacy. If you don't have the time to do it, well, then you don't have it, and intimacy suffers. Intimacy, like a plant, must be nurtured. Married men who work nights have six times greater divorce risk. So this stuff matters. These constraints, the constraints of just trying to get by and get your bills paid, directly affect the outcome of intimate relationships. In big ways, three times greater divorce risk, six times greater divorce risk, twice as high divorce risk, we think of divorce, for, and, and in, we think of the challenges of intimate relationships, and divorce in particular, as a national problem. But the truth is that it's not a national problem that affects everyone in the nation equally. It disproportionately falls on the backs of the poor. Micah. It's a good question. This work was done by a woman named Harriet Presser, and I'm trying to remember the details. My thought is that it's still negative. It's still negative to work nights, because basically what happens is people who work nights, you know, then sleep during the day, and they're, they're just all discombobulated. <laughs> um, but but I, could, I, I don't know the, the direct answer to your question. I could imagine, yeah, well, if the husband and the wife are both working nights, and have, but otherwise have identical schedules, you know, maybe that would be better than not having identical schedules. I, I can understand the intuition there, but my sense is that that rarely happens. Uh, Why? It? it is. Well, that's a really good point. So why? Why is point drawing from the chapter always a pleasure? Uh, is is that if even if both people in a couple are working night, nights. Why its point is that that would be very socially isolating. It would be very socially isolating to work, to have a, a, um, a schedule that is the reverse of everyone else that you might possibly draw social support from. And the, to the extent that it's isolating, well, we know that couples who are socially isolated are also at higher risk for divorce. Thanks for bringing that up. Was there a point, uh, is, that, is that Rock? Yeah. Rock? Uh, that is true. So Rock's point is, well, maybe the people who work at night also have other jobs during the day. Now, again, I'm not sure about this particular study, but it is true that people who work at night are more likely to have multiple jobs, too. So that doesn't mean that they, you know, they, oh, then in the day they're just having a good time watching soap operas. <laughs> Vicky. There is research on police officers. A little bit of research on police officers. Police officers' divorce rates are really, really high for a number of reasons. One is they have crazy hours. Another is it's a really stressful job. Really, really, really stressful job. For a, for a lot of reasons. 
including the hours. Um, so, but police officers make you know, lower middle class wages for very, very high stress. Um, so that's, I mean, so th I mean, we can talk about police officers in particular, but, but I know that their divorce rates tend to be really high. Lucas. Yeah, Lucas makes it. Lucas's point is, well, well, uh, what about couples that aren't poor, aren't poor, that maybe are even really rich, like doctors and business people, but who lack shared leisure time? Well, Lucas's point is, there's probably a trade-off there. On one hand, if you lack shared leisure time, that's bad for a relationship. On the other hand, if you're making a ton of money, that's good for the relationship because when you finally get together, you can go to the Bahamas for a weekend which if you're poor, that you don't have that option. When, on the, the, when you finally have the two minutes to share together. But this research was done on people who are poor in particular. So, what are we saying here? What we're saying is that, the, and, and we're saying a point that's I think quite profound and new for this course, that the development and maintenance of intimacy between two individuals is directly tied in to structural things, like the nature of the economy. Well, that's not something we think about a lot. You know, there's an economic change happening right now in the United States, right? We can't open a paper, you can't open news, news, um, a website without thinking about, wow, the unemployment rate is going up, the um, credit crisis, the mortgage crisis, defaults on homes. The point we're making today is all of that isn't independent from intimate relationships. It's going to affect intimate relationships, and it's affecting them now. And with that in mind, let's step back a little bit. I, I may have shown you this the first day. I, I have trouble remembering things. But um, divorce rates in the United States over the last century, are, it's kind of illustrative to look at, think about. It. Take a look at that. Have, did I show you this? Did I very show? Yes? I did show it to you? Well, I'm going to show it to you again. Divorce rates peaked after World War II. People came home from the war, got divorced, but then divorce rates fell, plummeted to a really low level where they stayed for about a decade and a half. And then they went up, where they've basically stayed. Then they sort of trailed off at the 80s. Now they're pretty, they've been pretty flat for the last few years. When you look at these historical trends in divorce, it raises a question, why why would you see these major shifts in divorce rates in the United States? What would go, what would go on here that would make divorce rates go from here to do, over double? Is it that, is it that in this decade, the 70s, people forgot how to talk to each other? Is it that people got more neurotic? That their attachment styles changed? Oh, in the 50s, everyone's attachment style was secure, but now suddenly their attachment style changed. Hard to imagine. Well, I'll tell you what did happen in the 1970s. The economy of the United States changed. You know what was true during this part of the, of the last century? A family of four could live comfortably on the wages of a single blue-collar worker. In the 1950s, a person working in a factory, for example, in an auto plant, could, on one income, support a family of four pay a mortgage, support a family of four, send everyone to school. That stopped being true in the 1970s. And you know what else rose in the 1970s? The number of two-income households of necessity. The economy changed in the 1970s. In the 1950s, one person could work and the other person could stay home. And often there was the husband working and the wife staying home. In the 1970s, that became economically impossible. A lot of people have taken this divorce curve and mapped it right on economic curves and gotten an almost perfect correlation. In other words, if you think about historical context, there's no reason to believe, oh, well, you know, our ability to be in a relationship, our ability to make adaptive attributions for our partner's mistakes somehow changed in the 70s. But what did change in the 70s is the structure of uh, the economic uh, of ec uh, economic outcomes in the United States. Question, what's your name? Marissa. Marissa. What's the scale on the y-axis? Scale on the y-axis is the per capita divorce rate. 
the number of divorces per year per thousand people in the population. Well, all this brings us to kind of interesting thing. In the United States, the fact that the poor segments of our country are more prone to break up their relationships or to have their relationships end early has not gone unnoticed. It has not gone unnoticed at all. In fact, for the last 15 years or so, marriage has been part of federal policy. Maybe you don't know that, but it has been. And it started in the Bill Clinton administration. When Bill Clinton was president of the United States, a Democratic president, there was some thinking about how can we improve the life of the poorest members of the United States, the poorest people in the United States. And to that end, Clinton authored legislation that reformed the welfare system. In fact, uh, you're probably too young to remember it, but he, he gave a speech saying, we are ending welfare as we know it. Welfare being, of course, a system of the federal government giving money to poor people to help them get by. In 1996, he wrote, or, or the Congress passed the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act, or PRORA, 1996, with the idea being, let's change how we help poor people. And the, what that bill did was it gave states, this is going to tie back to intimate relationships in a moment, it gave states flexibility in how they could spend welfare money. And what the bill said is states, hey states, we're going to give you the money and then you can pay the poor people any way you want. But we have some advice for you, states. Could you do us a favor and do four things? Three of those four things were try to get poor people jobs. The fourth of those things was try to help poor people get married and stay married. Because the government said, <clears throat> if poor people, if being poor is associated with high rates of divorce, maybe if we can lower rates of divorce, we'll have less poor people. At least that was the logic. Most of the states ignored that recommendation, just ignored it. Said, hey, it's not our job to get involved in people's marriages. Thank you very much. We'll focus on jobs. But in 2002, that changed. In 2002, the prora expired, and it had to be renewed. Now there was a new administration. This was a Republican administration of the second Bush administration. And um, <clears throat> it took them four years to pass new legislation about welfare. It took them four years. But in, this, in that four years, this bill changed. It changed a lot. The Bush administration said, now we want welfare to be much more focused on family life. We've gotten people hired in jobs. We're not worried about their jobs. Now we want them to stay married. In fact, we're going to make that the focus of the welfare system, to keep families, to form families and keep them together. We're going to make that the focus of welfare. So here's what they did. They said, we're going to take money, the money from the TANF program and give it to research and programs that promote marriage in low-income populations. What's the TANF program? TANF stands for Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. This was the new name of welfare. After 1996, welfare became TANF. Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, with the accent on the T, accent on the temporary. The new bill said, that money that we're allocating for needy families, we're going to take some of it out. And we're going to spend it exclusively on efforts to support relationships in poor people. Well, given everything we've said today, there's a lot to like about that policy. I mean, think about what we're saying. Today, so far, we've talked about how, in fact, divorce rates are higher in poor segments of the population. For a lot of reasons, life is very difficult for poor people in ways that make maintaining an intimate relationship extremely difficult. So, who could argue with taking money and explicitly using it to help relationships among poor people? It does sound like a pretty good idea. But there were some stipulations on how this money could be spent. 
You couldn't just spend it on any old thing. Oh, no. The bill was quite explicit about how that money would be spent. There were eight things, eight, eight things you could spend the money on and nothing else. You were not allowed to spend the money on anything but these eight things. Let's go over what the eight things are. And imagine if you were a poor family, how excited you would be about these eight things. Number one, you could spend the states were allowed to spend the money on advertising campaigns on the value of marriage. So posters saying, marriage, do it. Second, education in high schools on, the, on marriage values and relationship skills. So uh, the idea was to develop curricula, and I've seen some of these curricula, which adds a new course, a new required course to uh, co uh, high school curricula. You can start taking in so sophomore year or through senior year. Uh, it would be a relationships class, a little, bit like, a little bit like this one, where you learn, except in that class you sort of learn about marriage and why it's a good thing and also about how to have a good marriage. Education programs for non-married expectant and recent parents. So this is now uh, unmarried couples who are going in to get medical care for a baby would be getting education programs on why they should consider, to, they should consider getting married. Education and skills training for engaged couples or individuals thinking of getting married. So this is now a class, they're offering classes to people on how to Inter interact well, how to communicate better. Skills training programs for married couples, so this is for, for married couples who are already married, couples who are already married. T programs for how to communicate. Divorce reduction programs, again, that teach relationship skills. Marriage mentoring programs, so that, that's a program where couples who've been married for a long time, older couples, would talk to younger couples about their lives and sort of teach them how to be married a long time. The last one was programs to reduce tax incentives that, that um, operate against marriage, or what they call the, the marriage tax penalty, but only if offered in conjunction with any of this stuff. Just, do you recognize a theme here? Is there a theme here? Why? Why it says, what's the assumption here? What is it? Why it hits, hits it right on the head? There's an assumption here, which is that poor people are getting divorced. Why? Because they don't know how to be married. Because they don't know enough. Poor people somehow don't know enough to be married a long time. They don't want it enough, or they just don't know how to do it. So what the poor people need is education. We must educate the poor. That's, by the way, this is, these words are direct quotes from the language of the legislation. I did not make this up or summarize or paraphrase in any way. This is exactly the words from the legislation. And the assumption of this legislation is that poor people have high divorce rates because why? They don't know the value of marriage or they don't know how to do it. They don't have the skills. That's the assumption of this legislation. Was there a question over on the side? Question? Nope. Nope. Anything? Well, now that is a little bit different than what we were talking about a moment ago. A moment ago, we were citing research on poor couples, and we weren't saying they don't care about marriage. We weren't saying they don't know how to do marriage. We were saying that life is hard for them, which actually constrains having a good relationship. Yes? Is that? Mm, mm, mm. Melissa? <laughs> Megan? Megan? Hey, that's another good point. If we know that poor families have time constraints, so what are we going to give them? Some classes to take. Mika? Micah? It's $150 million per year for five years equals $750 million. So this is the legislation. It's money, a significant amount of money. You can do a lot with this money, but you, this is all you're allowed to do with the money. So the question is, is this a good use of the money? 
Do poor people need training in family values and relationship skills? Do they? Now, the research I cited prior didn't point in this direction. But that doesn't mean that, this quest, that the answer to this question is necessarily no. Maybe that is still a problem, it just wasn't studied before. Well, about the same time this was all going on in 2002, I was a young professor in the state of Florida, thinking about this stuff. I was studying stress in marriage. And I was thinking, oh, I'm not sure this is going the right way. I'm, I'm not sure I like how this is going. I wish. I wish somehow there was a way to be involved in this, to somehow do the right research, if only, if only. And then the phone rang. I swear, I, this is what happened. You want to hear the story? This is what happened. The phone rang. Hello? <laughs> and the person on the other end said, hi, I'm calling you from the Department of Children and Families of the state of Florida. And uh, we are thinking of doing some research on families in Florida sponsored by the state. We want to know if that's something you'd be interested in running, in, in designing for us. I said, How, who, who is this? Who is this really? And they said, this is really the Department of Children and Families, and we really are going to be doing this research, and we want to know if that's something you would be interested in. And I said, are you saying that this is, the governor at the time was uh, Jeb Bush. And I said, are you saying that Governor Jeb Bush would like to sponsor research on families? He's going to pay, and I get to design it? Yeah, I, I think I'd be in, yeah, I could do that. I could make some time for that. <laughs> Indeed, that is what happened in the year 2002. And I, I, by the year 2003, found myself designing a study in the state of Florida <laughs> for the uh, governor, Jeb Bush. <laughs> and this is what it looked like. We designed the Florida Family Formation Survey which was 20 to 25 minute telephone interviews with a uh, stratified random sample of the state of Florida. When I say stratified, what I mean is that we did over samples. So if you just get a sampling, you just call people up random digit dialing, you're going to not get a lot of poor people and you're not going to get a lot of minorities because those people are harder to reach. You'll get the people who are easy to reach, who are sitting at home at 6 o'clock, and those tend to be middle class white people. So we oversampled blacks, Hispanics, and low income people, and people who are specifically on welfare. I said, you guys run the welfare program, don't you? Yeah, yeah, we do. Um, could I get the list of all those people? Sure, no problem. OK, thanks. And we sampled from the actual welfare rolls, which otherwise we would never reach those people. And they allowed us, they paid Governor Bush, Jeb, I'll call him Jeb, Jeb, Bush, Jeb um, paid for us to do another 1,500 interviews in California, New York, and Texas. That's a lot of data. That's 6,000 people. And um, they weren't researchers, I'm a researcher, so I got to design the analysis and the survey. <laughs> so, so what did, we, what did we ask? Well, I, I wanted to answer this question. Now that's not exactly the question that they thought we were going to be addressing. But that's okay, I just sort of, you know, just sort of worked it in. <laughs> hmm. So, so um, what we asked was about values, about family values. And what I, what, what we, the analysis strategy was to compare people on the basis of income. So what I want to know is, do people who are receiving welfare or versus people who are low income, which is to say their household income was less than 200% of the poverty line, compared to middle income between 2 and 400% and high income, which is greater than 400%. And then we could do analyses that control for race, which is interesting but not directly interesting to me right now, control for gender, control for age, control for what kind of relationship you're in. The question is this. Are the values of the poorest members of society different from the values of the more wealthy parts of society? Because the legislation that was passed assumes that the answer to that question is yes, and it assumes that these people have less strong values for family and marriage and childbearing and all of that good family stuff. 
Therefore, that, and of course, that assumption justifies the decision to pay money to give poor people better values. The question is, is there evidence to support that assumption? Well, let's, uh, this is what we did. We asked people a couple items. For example, here's one item. To what extent do you agree that a happy, healthy marriage is one of the most important things in life? Here's what we got. Ten of people, low-income people, middle-income people, and high-income people. Looks like it's a big difference, but in fact, these are tiny differences. This is 8.72 on a nine-point scale. This is 8.66 on a nine-point scale, a difference of 0.06. Not a significant difference. There were no significant differences in the value of marriage. Whether you were on welfare, poor, middle class, or rich, everybody loves marriage. This is very close to the top of the scale, which was nine. Everybody thinks that marriage is great. And that's true in every study that's ever been done, by the way. People in the United States think that marriage rocks. Gay people think that marriage rocks. G gay, straight, young, old, divorced or not divorced, every, for the most part in the United States, the value of marriage is really, really high. Everyone thinks that marriage is a super good thing. What about attitudes towards divorce? You can imagine you might love marriage, but you're also quite tolerant towards divorce. Three items, one of which was this. Divorce can be a reasonable solution to an unhappy marriage. So if you agree with this, if you have a high score on this, you're saying, hey, if a marriage is bad, it's okay to get out. It's okay. To, divorce is okay. High score means I'm okay with divorce. I'm tolerant of divorce. Well, who's the most tolerant of divorce? This was a significant difference. People on welfare and the richest people. The, the people who were the absolute most tolerant of divorce were actually the people who were the highest income. What's interesting about that is, as we know, those people have the lowest divorce rates. The people with the lowest divorce rates are also the people who are the most tolerant of divorce. The low income people down here were quite intolerant, relatively speaking, even though we know their divorce rates are quite high. We asked them, what about, how do you feel about, is it okay for people, couples who are not married to live together? Co Premarital cohabitation, we say. Again, a significant difference. And which group was the most, who embraced this non-traditional family form? It's the, the richest people again. The, the, uh, there's a significant difference here. The, the most wealthy people were the mo people who were most in agreement that it's okay for couples who are not married to live together. What about uh, premarital sex? Okay, what about premarital sex? Here's the one item. Couples should wait to have sex until they get married. So if you agree with this, you are saying, I do not believe in premarital sex. No. So presumably, if you're more traditional, you would be more likely to agree with this. If you have higher family values, you'd be more likely to agree that, hey, couples should wait to have sex until they get married. You, you, like Bristol Palin would be your friend if you agree agree with this. Because she is now, of course, the National Abs Teen Abstinence Spokesperson. Well, it turns out that, guess what? These rich people are the people who are least in agreement with that. And the people who most agree that premarital sex is a no-no are the people who are all low income or on welfare. Now, we also know, I didn't mention this before, that these are also the two groups that have by far the highest rates of unmarried pregnancy. So if you're thinking about, uh, just to summarize a little bit, low-income groups value marriage as much as middle and high-income groups, according to this study, and according to every other study of this, uh, of this issue that's been done that I could find. But low-income groups are actually more traditional in terms of their attitudes towards cohabitation, premarital sex, and divorce. So if you are a policymaker, and you're lying awake at night concerned about the, the values of the poor, this is quite reassuring. Congratulations. That battle has been won. The poorest people in society, or at least the poorest people in the state of Florida, California, New York, and Texas, have all already agreed with you that cohabitation is bad, premarital sex is bad, and divorce is bad. The problem is, and if you've taken social psychology, this will not be news to you, attitudes are poor predictors of behavior. 
The fact that these values are in place does not change the fact that low-income groups are also much more likely to engage in cohabitation, premarital sex, and divorce. So these data say that if we're trying to understand divorce rates in low-income populations, values education may not be, might not be the way to go. Well, maybe it's a different kind of values, though. I mean, we really wanted to hit this hard. So we said, well, maybe it's, maybe it's not attitudes per se. Maybe it's high standards. And the, people have made this argument. For example, Andy Churlin, who actually is a person who I tremendously admire, said this, maybe the poor expect too much from their relationships. So here's this quote. When people evaluated how satisfied they were with their marriages, and he's thinking about like back in the day, decades ago, they began to think more, oh, he's, he, well, actually he's saying, this is what's happened in the, you know, in the recent decades. They began to think more in terms of development of their own sense of self and expression of their feelings, as opposed to the satisfaction they gained through building a family and playing the roles of spouse and parent. In other words, he's saying, you know what happened? You know what happened in the United States? Marriage became about being fulfilled personally as opposed to doing your duty for society. Now, we might argue that that's called, that you might say, hey, that's progress. That might be a good, you might call that a good thing. But the argument that follows from this is, well, maybe poor people get divorced because they expect too much from their relationships and they get disappointed when they don't get it. So maybe poor people are saying, oh, you know, if I don't have every emotional need fulfilled in my marriage, then I'm out. Whereas rich people are more likely to understand that, you know, you have to, marriage is a social contract. And so interventions aimed at low-income families emphasize the social functions of marriage. Saying, hey, uh, don't, th these, these curricula that are aimed at low-income populations, I've seen them, say things like, hey, marriages are work. An intimate relationship is work. Don't expect it's going to be super fun all the time. Don't expect you're going to get a lot of necessarily emotional connection, but... It's great for your kids and it's good for society. Heidi. Um, isn't that also reflective how the culture of men and men are Because That's exactly the argument. So Heidi's like, so wouldn't that, that's an alternative explanation of the historical trends in divorce. Yes, it's exactly right. The argument is that what happened when divorce rates went up in the 70s is that people started saying, oh, you know, if I'm not personally happy, I'm going to get out of here. But since we know that divorce rates are higher in the poor than in the rich, the real argument is that poor people in particular are somehow failing to recognize that marriage is a social contract and that poor people themselves are saying, you know, I, I think that or I'm not going to stay in any relationship that doesn't give me emotional fulfillment and sexual passion and all these wonderful things that the rich people understand, you're just not going to get. So we tested that too, actually. What? So Wyatt says, you know, maybe, maybe, Wyatt says, I'm going to, it's spinning a different story, saying maybe standards are working in the opposite way. For, for poor women especially, maybe if their standards are too high, that's preventing them from getting married in the first place. Because they, they see that there's no way they'll be able to fulfill their standards. So they're staying out of the marriage game entirely. Well, it's an empirical question, and we addressed it. And the way we addressed it is by asking couples, we asking the individuals, what do you expect from marriage or from your intimate relationships? And here's how we asked them. We said, I'm going to list different parts of marriage, and I will ask you to tell me whether you think each item is very important, somewhat important, or not important for a successful marriage. That's a question about standards. It's saying, what do you think is important for a good marriage? And then we compared the answers 
that the middle and high income people gave us and the low and welfare people gave us. Here's what we found. Some standards were significantly less important to the poor people, like this. Poor people were significantly less likely to say that it's important to have the same beliefs and values. Poor people said, no, that's not as important to me. As having good sex, not as important to me. Supporting each other through difficult times, no, I don't need that, not as much anyway. Understanding each other's hopes and dreams, it's lovely, but poor people were less likely to say that's critical. Being able to communicate effectively, in other words, all the stuff we've been talking about so far in this course, poor people were significantly less, not more, less likely to say that that's important to a good marriage. Hmm. Well, what's more important to the lower income people? Being of the same race or ethnic group? Husband having a steady job, wife having a steady job, and having savings you can draw from. Does that sound like unrealistic standards to you? In fact, there's no evidence that low-income populations demand, have these unrealistic demands for high intimacy, support, communication, and emotion. Just the opposite. Low-income populations are more likely to report that they care about social and financial stability, the very thing that, as poor people, they lack. So really no evidence that somehow in the, poor, in, the, in the parts of society where divorce is more prevalent, you also have these really high standards for emotional connection. Not at all. Poor people, in fact, are more likely to report, we understand marriage is about having money, having a job. That's what a good marriage is about. In other words, fulfilling a social role. Well, maybe the real problem is just that Maybe poor people just have more problems with the stuff that rich people take for granted. Maybe poor people are having more problems with communication, so they still need that, those, that skill training. They still need to sort of be trained in how to be good in relationships. Well, we asked that too. We asked that too. We asked them, hey, how much are each of the following topics a source of difficulty between the two of you? We gave them a long list of topics, marital problems, possible problems, and we said for each one, tell me, is it a very serious problem, a moderate problem, barely a problem, or not a problem at all? And again, we controlled for race and gender. We just wanted to know, what's the effect of income? Because the programs, the policies, this $750 million is being devoted to low-income populations. So I want to know, what's the evidence that low-income populations need what the government is about to give them? Now let's take a look. There were some problems that were equally problems for all income levels. No matter whether you were rich or poor, it didn't make a difference to how much spending time together was a problem. Everybody wants more time together. Sex, everyone's having sex problems. It doesn't matter if you're rich, poor, or middle class. Each other's parents, nobody likes their in-laws. <laughs> poor people, rich people, in-laws are still in-laws. Kind of comforting. Being a parent, having children, it's, a, it's an issue regardless of income level. Communication is an issue regardless of income level. Household chores, whether you're rich or poor, you, everyone wears socks and everyone throws them on the side of the bed. <laughs> so there's no effort, I mean, so the, 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 the training, the relationship skills training that is being sold focuses on communication, and spending time together, and sex, and dividing up household labor. But those are not the unique problems of the poor. Well, what are the unique problems of the poor? The problems that are more severe in low-income populations are, surprise, money, drinking and drug use, fidelity, and friends. Well, those are serious problems. But not the problems that are focused on by relationship skills training. Sarah. By friends, you mean social support. What does friends mean? It's a good question. Unfortunately, I don't know what friends means, because all we did is, to what extent are friends a source of difficulty in your relationship? Anecdotally, my sense is, the issue is, are we fighting about your friends? Fighting about the, who you hang out with, who you spend time with, and the amount of time you spend with them. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine a couple fighting about, hey, why are you always going off with your friends? I want, you to I want you to come with me. I don't like those people you hang out with. 
Those are bad people you hang out with. I don't want you to go out with them. Hey, they're my friends. I'm going to go out with them, and you, you stop. <laughs> that could be, maybe that's what the argument is, Sarah. Something like that. A little more articulate than that. The point is that the problems that are especially severe for low-income couples may, in fact, be independent of relationship skills and attitudes. So we started this whole, so, so you know, that's kind of interesting. And we wrote up a report about this and submitted it to Governor Jeb Bush. How do you like it? Because the conclusion absolutely was, we found no evidence at all that attitudes training or skills training is likely to help poor people because we have no evidence at all that poor people have bad attitudes, weaker attitudes, or lower skills. None. Oddly, the reception to this in, in, in Tallahassee was not very, very positive or enthusiastic. Uh, what happened was this, kind of interesting story actually, an interesting story about, about science and how it gets disseminated. So I was excited about this. I thought this was big news because there was all this money about to be rolled out in the state of Florida and I was saying, look, the data show that we should not take that money and spend it on these programs because there might be better programs. Don't you think that's newsworthy? Shouldn't that be a headline? That's what I thought as a, as a young, naive scientist. Now I'm an old, crusty scientist. <laughs> so here's what happened. The University of Florida press office said, you know, I told them about this, and I said, I think it's time for a press release. And they said, sure. And they came to my office, and they asked me, what's this study all about? I told them. I said, and here's the big news. And what I said was, giving poor people relationship skills training without any other, any other way of improving their lives is like giving piano lessons to kids, but no access to pianos. I was really proud of that quote. And it got, into the, it got into the press release. And then they went back and wrote it up. And then they, said, oh, well, and then they sent it back to me to, to get my approval. And then I um, sent it back to them. And while we were doing all that, the state issued their own press release, which said, University of Florida researcher discovers that Floridians value marriage. That was the headline. which didn't get a lot of play, oddly. <laughs> like, it didn't get a lot of distribution. People weren't that excited about that headline because it wasn't an exciting headline. And I was not given it, you know, I was not shown that press release. It, I just, someone sh shared it with me, like, hey, did, did you see this press release? Is that related to you? I said, yeah, that is me. <laughs> but, you know, nobody wanted to talk about it. And then a day later, our press release came out, and the newspaper said, wait, wait a minute, wasn't this already in the paper? We already put a blurb on this, and it was over, and it was buried. And that's what happened. So the report uh, you know, was never posted on like, the Department of Health and Human Services website. Nothing. Now, I've published on it. I mean, but um, that's, it's, I mean, that's a parenthetically kind of interesting story about how research and policy are related, which is to say they're not that re well related. <laughs> that the policy is the policy. And uh, I think the research is incredibly relevant to the policy, but that doesn't mean that it affects policy. And we might have a discussion privately about, well, does that make the research useless? No, I think it's valuable to know what's going on. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't mean you're going to necessarily change policy. And imagine, as, frustrated, as frustrating as that experience was, uh, imagine how frustrating it might be to be a person who studied global warming for the last couple decades and being ignored. Imagine somebody who had studied um, whether or not there was weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Uh, there's a lot of people who are doing research who you know, wish that they were listened to, and I'm joining that, that crowd. Micah? Um, so, so basically, it was actually, this research was actually a notion in the way that those bugs were propelled. Well, that's kind of harsh. <laughs> no, no, I'm, it, it's, it's, it couldn't be more accurate. So Micah said, so let me get this straight. You're saying you did all this research and it made exactly no difference for anyone at all? Well, yes. <laughs> well, I'm not asking for your sympathy, but that's just the way the world works. Oh yes, they're still ramping it up. 
So the implications for policy. Just for the fun of it, <laughs> let's talk about the implications for policy. Now, by the way, you know, life is long. And um, change is slow, especially at the, at the level of policy. So I still have hope that things will change and that um, you know, I, I continue to consult for the government and talk to people in the administration, children, families. And uh, so you know, there are voices. There are multiple voices there. Also, administrations change. My understanding is there's a new administration. What's his name? Guy named Obama. I've a lot, a lot of, I hear a lot of good things about him. But the answer is: Should welfare money? The question is: Should welfare money be diverted towards values education? Well, maybe, but we found no evidence to support that idea. And in fact, I'm aware of no evidence to support that idea. Not just in my lab, but anywhere else. Well, what would be the implication then? What would be the implication of this work and of everything we've talked about today? If you want to help poor families, poor relationships, have better relationships, what would you do? Well, one of the implications of everything we've talked about the today is if divorce goes up when people's lives are difficult, then anything we do to make their lives less difficult should lower divorce rates. That is the implication. Anything that we do that makes people's lives better, that give people more space to breathe, that give people more time to just be at home, we don't have to tell them what to do while they're home. Just give them more time to go into the bedroom and lock the door. Anything that we as a society do to promote that should promote intimacy indirectly, even if we don't even talk about intimacy. Even if we don't touch intimacy, anything we do to improve people's lives will improve intimacy, according to what we're saying here. Give people more time. They have more time for intimacy. Let them figure out how to do it. That's the implication. Is there any direct evidence? Well, there is something. Something I love, a recent study. My favorite study that came out in the year 2008 was done in Norway. It's a good study. Here's what they did. They looked back at divorce data in that country before and after a policy change that happened in the early 2000s, I think like 2002. Here was the policy change. The, the, the country made a new policy that offered government subsidized child care in the early years of life for everybody having a new baby. So in the state of, in the country of Norway, after, I think it was the year 2002, if you had a baby, you would have some child care coming to your house to help you out, subsidized by the government. That's a pretty good policy. And the question that they asked was, did you see any change in the divorce rate? Heidi. I don't know. Apparently it's Sweden, another one of those blonde countries. <laughs> the point being, I don't know, it. maybe Norway has a bunch of great programs too. But the question is, was there an effect of this program? So because the, now we're looking at longitudinal data. We're comparing the divorce rate in Norway to the divorce rate in Norway after this change in policy. So it's the divorce, Norway, the country, operates as its own control, you see. We're comparing the country to itself. Well, I wouldn't be talking about this if the results weren't favorable. And the results were favorable. In fact, divorce rates went down precipitously, especially during that period. So for divorce rates for couples who have just had children went down when the government gave people what? Values education? No. What? Skills training? Communication training? Here are five things, five ways to be nice to your spouse? No. <laughs> the policy didn't talk about divorce at all. The policy didn't talk about marriage one bit. But it affected marriage because it gave couples more time. It made life better. And when you make life better, divorce rates go down. Huh without having to teach people nada. Could it happen here? Could it? Well, it's not looking promising. Uh, partly because in the United States, of course, as again, as we were mentioning before, our economy is in trouble. The state economy of California is in a special trouble. 
thanks to our fantastic electorate who voted on Tuesday not to approve any of the budget measures. So what we'll see in the United States, in, in California, in the country as a whole, and in California in particular, is cutting of services. Now that's, that's not a matter of opinion. I think that's pretty much a statement of fact. The question is, who will be affected more by them? Well, whatever segment of the population depends on government services more is going to be affected more by the cuts. That is the poor. So the life of the poor is not going to get easier. It's going to get harder. And the implication of what we said today is that that's going to affect family life in negative ways. So, what can you do about it? What can you do about stress? So now, you know, there's been you know, a little some pessimism, perhaps, in the room, and I don't, uh, that's, I don't want to be a downer. So um, <clears throat> let's say you're thinking about, well, and you've been thinking for the last two lectures about stress in your own life. Like, you know, sometimes I have some stress in my life. What can I do about it to preserve my relationship, my intimacy, during times of stress? And um, my first suggestion is run for office, get a couple of really good laws passed, and change the social structure in a way that makes life better for you and, coincidentally, for everybody else. That would be my first choice. Change the context that, and make it a context that makes life better for all intimate relationships. Now, let's say you're in more of a rush. You don't have time to run an election. Maybe you're not committed enough to run for public office. Fine. There are still things you can do to minimize the negative effects of stress on your relationship. By the way, plan B. Plan A was change the social. Plan B, get more resources. But if that's tough, like be, be richer, get more friends, be closer to your family. OK, that doesn't work. Plan C. This is, this is just plan C. Plan C is this, pay attention to stress. <laughs> pay attention to stress. Did you take social psychology? Anyone who takes social psychology knows about, oh, nice. Um, <clears throat> you know about the fundamental attribution error. What's the fundamental attribution error? The fundamental attribution error is that human beings tend to focus on what people do and tend to ignore what the environment does. And people in intimate relationships do that just as much as anybody else. We focus on our partners. We ignore how our partners and our relationships are affected by the context. It's easy to do. It is the fundamental attribution error. When stress hits, don't make that error. If you can't change society and you can't change your level of resources and you got stress and you can't avoid it, what you can do is pay attention to it and not ignore it. There's evidence that people who do that have stronger relationships. And this is the evidence. I told you on Wednesday about my pal Niall Bolger and his research on couples taking the bar exam. Remember that? He measured them every single day on the way, in like the 40 days prior to taking the bar exam. Very stressful. Well, what I didn't tell you, because I was saving it. I wasn't hiding it from you. I was just saving it. What I didn't tell you was this. The associate in those couples, the association between the, the, the partner who was taking the exam and the supportive partner, let me put this another way. He looked at the association between the anxiety in the partner and the mood of the supportive partner. And what he found was that four weeks out from the exam, the more anxious and in a bad mood the person studying for the exam was, the more bad mood was felt by the person who wasn't studying for the exam. An example of a phenomenon we named last time called stress. Nice. Very nice. But here's the fun part. The closer they got to the exam, the weaker that association. So that the week before the exam, there was no association. The week before the exam, there was no association between how anxious the partner was who was studying and the mood of the non-studying partner. Why not? Why not? Someone. OK, Jordan. Absolutely. 
Jordan says, the closer they got to the exam, the more salient the exam was as a source of the, of the partner's anxiety. The more it was obvious that your partner was anxious because of the exam, the less you were affected by your partner's anxiety in that particular study. If, you're, if the source of stress is salient, you, it's easier to make the correction. It's easier to say, wait a minute, yeah, things aren't going well because you've got an exam tomorrow. I'm, I'm okay with that. We can do that for our partners. We can do that for our relationships. It doesn't have to be the bar exam. We can do it for a final exam. We can do it because your partner's just had a bad day. We can just pay attention to the context. Some, it would be great to change the context, but if we can't change it, we can pay attention to it. The irony is that stress makes this hard to do. It's effortful to pay attention to it. It's just another thing to attend to. And when we're under stress, that's harder. But a challenge worth taking up, class dismissed.